Uh, the play Toothpaste and Cigars is written by T.J. Daw and Michael Rinaldi. It's like a fringe festival play. It's, uh, it's a one act, and it's, mm. it's two-hander. So the whole play is really just uh, Daniel and Zoe's characters in the movie. Um, I went to see it uh, in a bar, actually, in like, two, like November or December 2004, and I was really just like caught up in it was just really charming and smart about modern relationships and had these two great characters and it sort of sparked a lot of ideas for me um, I had really been interested in writing something just about men and women and friendship and romance and I found the play sparked a lot of ideas and I was interested in seeing where where this story could go um, in the nature of you know a one-act play like it wasn't really a movie there's only two people in it um, but it implied a world around them that I was interested in exploring. And so uh, with a producer friend, Mark Stevenson, who's one of the producers on the picture, we, uh, he, optioned the, and I, he optioned the play and I started uh, working on the script. Um, and it took a little while. Like I started writing in 2005. Uh, it took a couple of years for me to figure it out. And I think because I loved the play and so I wanted to like honor the play, but I think I, I needed to like let the play go too. And I sort of realized that the, the best way to uh, adapt a great play isn't to just put it on screen, it's to write a great movie. And even if that means you're sort of stepping away from the play, it actually will be better for the play in the long run. And also because it's a two-hander, it gave me a lot of freedom to create the whole ensemble. I mean, none of the other characters in the, in the, in the movie are in the play. Adam Driver and Mackenzie Davis, Megan Park, Rafe Spall, et cetera, Jemima Rupert, et cetera, et cetera. So that was fun too, because I got to kind of populate it with, with other characters and expand their world. Once we cast the movie, I was delighted. I mean, I started writing this movie like many years ago, like Daniel was like a teenager. So right, it wasn't right, like somebody right. that I imagined. Right. But as soon as we met him, like he's so, he's so like witty and self-effacing and smart and and really cares. He's like a very like thoughtful guy. Um, and as soon as I met him in, in real life, I was like, he's perfect for the part. Uh, if we can capture even like half of what he's like off camera, on camera, we're gonna have mm -hmm. something really special. It's the same with Zoe. I mean, she's. I think people sometimes like people like she's not really like her character in the movie, but she's a wonderful person and. Um, and you know, you meet these people, and you're like, it's not just that they're great for the part, and they're they're great actors, but they're great collaborators. They're people that you want to spend hours and hours on set with. So one character says, like, can men and women really be friends, or do you secretly want to bang Chantry? You know, and part of throwing that line in there was like, it's a total nod to the, to when Harry met Sally. Right. But it's also like the point of the way, and the way Mackenzie delivers, Mackenzie Davis delivers the line is that like, look, we know when Harry met Sally exists. Like, this is a world where you they, the two characters. Go see The Princess Bride, which is a Rob Reiner movie, the director of When Harry Met Sally. I like writing movies where the characters are aware of movies that exist. They don't have to talk about it all the time. Right. It's like a you know, zombie movie where like zombies rise up and like no one's ever heard of a zombie. I was like, I was like, you, what? You guys have never heard of zombies before in this movie? Like, they always have to. Have, the scientist has to explain what a zombie is. And I always find those scenes sort of like dorky because it, everything else about the movie is realistic, right? Um, and I like that with all movies. It's like I think I think Wallace and Chantry have seen when Harry met Sally. They're aware that this is a thing. Sure. But they're but when it happens to you in your real life, it's still complicated it's like it just just because when Harry met when Harry met Sally didn't solve this problem <laughs> right. you know what I mean like it wasn't like we we're like oh thankfully 25 years ago when Harry met Sally came out and and, and no male female friendship was ever complicated again uh, and so I you know that was 25 years ago I just wanted to like I wanted to like write a, a modern version of that story that was that that explored it in the way that made sense to me like a lot of things in the movie there's like a lot of elements that are in the play that were that were very funny and charming and then in the, in the sort of difference between taking like a one-act play and turn it into a feature, like I was able to take a lot of those elements and then use them in different and interesting kind of like ways, uh, which is part of the fun um, of an adaptation. And so, yeah, the, 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 the Fool's Gold is originally in the play and then I kind of ran with it and I loved the idea of um, this kind of like gross, messy, disgusting, delicious sandwich uh, also becoming like a love letter between the characters. First time the director, Michael Dowse, came over to my house to like, when he'd signed on to do the movie, he was gonna come over and we were gonna do like a script session. I, I was like, okay, my, I told my, you know, my, my uh, wife, I'm like, I'm gonna make him fool's gold when, she, when he comes over. And she's like, you're gonna give him a heart attack and he's not gonna be able to direct the movie. Give him some vegetables. And I was like, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe that's for the rap party. And we, and we did actually have some fool's gold at the rap party.